This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by the brain trust behind The World's End and the Cornetto trilogy, Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, and Nick Frost. Uh, for me, the first thing I wanted to ask about is bringing this trilogy to an end. Um, you know, this is it's been six years since Hot Fuzz, you know, this is obviously one of the most anticipated films, especially considering, you know, it's up against, you know, $200 million blockbusters. It's got a huge amount of anticipation. What is it like for you guys to close this up? I've heard you say it's a very personal film for you guys. I know, you know, this has got to be an interesting thing. You guys have all gone in divergent paths, but ultimately this is sort of a unifying thing amongst you. And this is the bookend to the Cornetto trilogy, at least. What is that like to wrap up? I think it feels very satisfying um, because, you know, we, we wanted to do a third movie and I think when the idea... Came... What the funk? Hello? It's your supervisor. <laughs> Press the button. Hello? Just so something a little... Oh, no, we're right in the middle of an interview at the moment. Oh, this is a Mr. Wainwright? No. No, there is no Mr. So. Wainwright. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> That was the secret code for my Nuru. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rainwright is our heroin dealer. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, what was it like to wrap up, essentially, is what I was asking? Yeah, it, 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 it felt very good because we wanted to make good on our promise and, and, and we wanted to make a third film. And when the idea for the story came together, we actually realized that we could actually wrap up themes that are in the other movies. And, you know, uh, there are lots of things that connect the movies, but one of them is about the theme of just kind of growing up and taking responsibility. And it felt like there was a nice kind of like um, way of twisting that arc in this one in terms of that Simon's character, Gary, wants to be 18 again and is going to drag his friends back in time through the magic time machine that is alcohol. <laughs> time and relative dimension in Stella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think That's was, good. Thank you. Um, one of my favorite parts of the movie was that the dynamic between you guys um, has changed. I mean, you know, Simon's character is, I don't want to say unlikable, but he's more challenging and more, I don't know, perhaps deeper in terms of the complexity. Well, it challenges you to like him. I mean, the film challenges you to sympathize with him because he is immediately maddening and irritating and kind of he's that frustrating friend that, that never grew up that you wish would you know evolve like perhaps you have done and if you haven't oh, yeah. done oh, it yeah. you are Sorry. Gary um, but you know we, we wanted to make him like that so that when you um, when you discover the truth of him you realize that you know perhaps you should have been a little bit more understanding I mean, w was that an intentional decision to sort of change that dynamic? I mean, I, I really like making Nick's character almost the straight man for a good chunk of time. I, was that something that you calculated going into the film or just a serendipitous like, well, this is sort of idea. This, is, I guess, is how it's going to have to play out. Yeah, I mean, it, the idea when, when we were writing the film, I, I kind of we needed Gary to be the kind of the chaos of it all. You know, in, in the last two films. You know, Ed and Danny have been the ones that have precipitated the, you know, it's the, the, the events of the film somewhat. You know, it's Sean's love of Ed that causes him to sort of be arrested and it's Danny's influence on Angel that causes him to become like a badass hero. Whereas with this film, we wanted the, the protagonist to be the one that catalyzes everything in the film. And so that had to be Gary, which was me. And also, we don't want people to get think they know what's coming all the time and think oh, okay it's going to be this dynamic you know you're going to have the kind of serious guy and his childlike friend in whatever capacity well you know also we're we're, we're, we're I think people forget sometimes that we're actors and these are performances we put in you know these are roles that we play this, this isn't us I mean yeah, you know there is some of us in all of the characters we've played but you know it's it's any any chance to do something which you haven't done before in terms of performance is a is a treat and a challenge you know is it, is it, was it all a concern going in making Gary a more challenging character and, and perhaps changing your character from, you know, being like a bumbling um, friend or something like that? Because you're balancing this issue of likability versus, I don't know, recklessness, complexity, that it might be harder for maybe mainstream audiences or whatever to appreciate we don't really want to make those prescriptions, you know. We don't really want to just go, oh, the mainstream might... It's up, to, it's up to filmmakers to challenge the mainstream. It's up to filmmakers to, you know, don't just give everybody what they want the whole time, otherwise they turn into zombies, you know. And so the, G Gary is a challenge to warm to, but that's part of the... F 
the, his function as a character and part of the audience experience of watching the movie. You know, you have to you have to see Gary in that form. You know, we, you can't just you know baby powder everybody because it's what they want. I think that would be doing everyone a disservice, and that's what turns audiences into you know mindless jellyheads. You know, I think if you <laughs> were to watch the first thirty minutes and and leave, you know, you would certainly be left with one one idea of Gary but if you sit and enjoy the whole film you'll see that it's it's not as simple as that you know he's he's a man who is 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 suffering who's in pain and it's a you know I think, I think a lot of the characters are that way I think a lot of them reveal that complexity as the film goes on it's sort of like yeah. their tropes in the beginning why are they there you know why did they follow him and, and, and also you know we wanted to there's without getting too much away there's a twist in the sense of like um you know we have I mean, it's not too big a reveal to say that there are robots in the film, but when you start the movie, like, um, <laughs> but when you start the movie, that the the adults have fallen into this kind of conformity, which they might be very comfortable with, but it's it's almost that thing of like trying to always show both sides of the argument is that you know is it is it pathetic that Gary craves to be the eighteen year old rebel again. Probably, but then on the flip side, does he want to be like sort of done down by the man? You know, sort of. So when it finally comes to it, you and hopefully the idea is that you take somebody who's like a, a a walking train wreck of a man, but there are some aspects of him that you have to be on his side because you don't want to be like part of the machine. You know, and also the others have conformed as well. In that, you know, it's not like they're coming from a good place. You know, Andy wanted to do family law and he's doing corporate law, and Pete's still working for his dad and Stephen's trying to have sex with a woman almost half his age you know it's like they're all in their own way unhappy oddly Martin is running a boutique estate agency which is so he's probably the least conformist of them all which is ironic yeah <laughs> he's probably the most happy as well yeah <laughs> One of the interesting things, and you sort of brought this up in terms of not revealing stuff about the movie, is that, you know, this is something you've had in some capacity in the making for six years. Uh, you guys are clearly very passionate that you're going out and touring this film, when I'm sure all of you have very busy calendars that you could be spending otherwise. Oh, I'm all right, you know. I'm free. <laughs> <Absolutely> free. <laughs> but what, what is it like, you know, fighting that sort of spoilers and the internet and all that stuff? I mean, like, I, I saw Wikipedia today, and they literally had the entire cast listed there, the entire plot listed there, and it's sort of like, it's a shame that we have a culture that people seem unable to avoid that information getting out there. Uh, you know, it's just, I think it's the unfortunate nature of um, the internet, but I think if you want to, you know, I think if people are kind of smart enough that they, it's only people who want to kind of like have a strange desire to know everything before they go in <laughs> who read that stuff. So I think if you, uh, I don't know, I, it, it's something that's un, unavoidable. I think the bad thing is is when, when you can't avoid them, I think when people are ex exposed to them who don't want to see them, if you, want, if you are someone who seeks out spoilers, you are weak in some respects because you want to anesthetize yourself against the tensions and the, you know, the, the emotional ride of the film. You want to ensure that you don't experience the film in the way that it's intended to see. And for, I, I believe that's a weakness. If you, and people can seek that out if they want to, it's fine. You know, if, if, if that's, that's a personal decision. It's a silly one, but it's a personal decision. But when things are, when you can't help it because things are being spoken about on Twitter or something, that becomes frustrating because you want people who want to be guarded against the secret, you know, guarded against knowing anything about the film to be protected. So we go out of our way to protect the secrets of the film for those people, you know. What's it like just in terms of you as you look back on your career is to put sort of this book end in it I mean you've all gone on to do big things but is this sort of like opening a new chapter in your careers because this is you talk about you know growing up you guys have clearly grown up together whether it be spaced or the world's end or whatever this is you've spent a long time together is this a, I don't know the end of a chapter or the opening of the next it's section the end, what I think you right, it's, the end, it's the end of a chapter and, and, and that's all it is you know we, we will do more stuff together but we wanted to kind of like have these films these three films exist as a as a as a potential set you know you could see them as a as a threesome you know a trilogy is often said but that it's a little lofty word but and it's not <laughs> what we intended initially but now looking back you could see them as yeah. that you know because there are there are things which bind them together the next film we make together won't have to have any of that criteria that we set for the first three you know now we can go somewhere else with it we can set it somewhere else set is it that in the past. very liberating though? yeah totally it's 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 nice because it feels like 
I feel like a sense of closure without having to think, oh, I'm never going to work with these guys again, because that would that would be deeply sad. Was that an intentional sort of thought process in making the film? Because the film is, in its own sense, uh, a story about getting closure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what we wanted to do is something that where there's, there's a... Because, you know, the idea of, like, uh, arrested development and perpetual adolescence goes through the three movies and even spaced as well and we thought of uh you know one of the things that was the idea for the story is that the film is about that and the denouement is about that and it's sort of about you know showing um again without giving too much away just how how it kind of wraps up and how different people find their happy endings you know um so so it was it was definitely intended to kind of give some closure to some themes that sure. preoccupy us you were uh, slightly distracted by the term happy ending. I did. I, I absolutely did. You I said happy endings. And then I, 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 I was like, happy sort of like ending, you know, no, I just like, that. I suddenly like my mind went to some kind of part. massage parlor you visited in uh, <laughs> Philadelphia. Okay, Mr. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Whitmore. Comes out August 23rd. August 23rd. Yeah. It's a website for it. The, the worldsendmovie.com, I believe. And uh, you all are active on Twitter, so I'm presuming that's the best place to find yeah. out what you guys have. Yeah, out. we are yeah. plugging it like whores at the moment on at Twitter. At Nick J. Frost. At Simon Pegg. At Edgar Wright. Don't um don't call Mr. Wainwright, though, because yeah. <laughs> no, no, okay. he's got something very different in store. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. And Thank uh, check Thank out you, more reviews at MacGuffin. That's MacGuff.in, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks MacGuff. MacGuffin. Thanks, MacGuffin. can't stop me. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's don't even try to bite the side of the Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.